whether it is failing to come to somebody's aid or failing to have the resolve to turn the other cheek or actually they might have different consequences in the world, but they're actually of a kind in terms of their failure, something like that I'm hearing from you. Mm -hmm. and, and that actually makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense because in both cases, I mean, that's what makes it hard, right? In both cases, accepting torment without impulsive retaliation or intervening to potentially save somebody's life, the situation requires it, are both self-sacrificial. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right? They're both they're both they're both the giving up of oneself. Yeah, yeah, that's a nice through line. To serve something good, right? Mm -hmm. To serve the good in some sense, right? And uh, and that's why they're both they're both manifestations of courage. And they're both ontocentric in a way. And they're both ontocentric and not egocentric. That's exactly right. Mm. I think that's exactly right. So the orientation is what actually is what connects them. Not the action, but the orientation. From where does the action come and to what is the action directed? That's what that's what that's how they're affined together. Hello and welcome back to Climbing Mount Sophia. Today, I have the pleasure of being joined by Christopher Maestro Pietro again. Um, Chris has become a good friend to me and has been very helpful, um, as he always is, whether I'm talking to him in person or just watching him um, speak with someone else. He always seems to show me things, whether new or Whether new views or old that um, are deeply helpful in moving into a closer relationship to Sophia. And so in this adventure, we um, start off attempting to get a look at the will and the way in which our imagination plays a central role in where our will carries us. Um, and then from there, we end up talking about justice and courage a little bit in terms of making decisions that are difficult when it comes to confront the confrontation with evil. So um, it starts off a little bit slow because we were um, a bit tired still. We did it early in the morning. So um, welcome and uh, thanks for joining. I've been in this place where I've been really trying to understand motivation internally and try to try to really pull apart why I'm doing one thing versus another thing. And that's led me down some interesting paths in regard to the notion of the will. Um, I'm reading Schindler has this book, Freedom from Reality. That um, have you read it? No. Okay. Um, I'm no. reading it right now, and it's uh, like the first half of it. He's um, going through the philosophy of John Locke, and John's John Locke's conception of freedom and the will, and this turn where the will went from the classical notion of being oriented toward the good beyond itself to this kind of upwelling of power. Mm. Um, and I'm finding so many things inside myself and just kind of, I guess, like cultural programming um, kind of laid bare in that. And so it, it's it's been... It's been this this experience of finding a lot of places where I thought I was acting that I wasn't that I'm not actually acting. Mm 
you know, the, and 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 so what I've what seems to be coming up as the way as maybe a better way to think about it is this notion of imagination and um and especially the way John talks about the imaginal in terms of well to explain what I mean more is seems like when I see things and I have a, a sense of what how I want to relate to them or situations and how I want to relate to them the the availability of how to do that or options of ways to do that seems to be primarily associated with my imagination and how how it's oriented and how well it's functioning and i notice that most of most of my actions kind of come downstream of that kind of space so i've been trying to play more with noticing and and trying to work with how my imagination grocks the world um and especially in the sense of I, I notice how often I'm playing a kind of egoic fantasy in my mm. imagination. It's like all the time I'm it's it's I'm I'm having I'm, I'm following some train of thought that basically boils down to you know what does this person suppose you know what is the generative model I have of this person think of whatever opinion or thing that I am doing over here and how does that impact my you know the view that they would have of my narrative self right and so to, and so that's kind of putting a lot on the table of just kind of how this has been unfolding for me and so i don't know i thought you might be um well you're one of the wisest people i know so i thought it might be quite helpful to <laughs> to talk about it with you <laughs> oh that's well that's very kind um that's that's that very familiar feeling yeah um so just not just make sure i understand you right so it sounds like the what you're saying is that yeah you're finding there's a certain kind of um that you've been sort of that day-to-day -day where your attention goes or what you find yourself doing or you find yourself attending to is sort of becoming it's it's a little more automatic than mm -hmm deliberate and that what where you find yourself you, there's sort of the steps that you find yourself tracing are following the sort of the stencil lines of wherever your imagination is pulling you but because it's so it's so um it reminds me of sort of when you're sitting in a meditation and you're trying to focus and your imagination has pulled you into a different direction before you've realized it's pulled you into a different direction. You catch yourself maybe like 10 seconds in, 15 seconds into a stream of thought and you go, oh shoot, <laughs> I didn't I didn't actually realize that I was imagining because the imagination, I was asleep in the imagination. <laughs> and then you wake up in it, you go, oh, you know. Um, it sounds a little like that to me when I hear you say it, that you're, you're sort of you're you're following the trench lines of something and finding yourself caught in fantasy and that the the stencil lines of the fantasy are so deeply grained and so automatic that you lapse into them without fully without it being conscious or deci or decisive or deliberate or intended or anything like that it just sort of occurs to you it's like you fall into a dream yeah right and that the dream, the dream that uses the avatars of other people as proxies for fears or anxieties or hopes or desires is actually the thing that is guiding your will much of the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's very well put. Yeah. Right? Is that is that right? Is that fair? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. 
Yeah, right, right. And 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 then and then when you wake up in a moment of that especially if the moment the moment is you know not just a moment but if it's days or weeks or months or i've had moments like that of waking up and realizing that so much of what's guided my thought and action has been a kind of a has been a, a layer that's been sort of a substrate to thinking that's underneath all of the conscious process that is really where all of the decisions have been made that's really yeah. where all of this stuff has actually happened. Yeah. And it's yeah. not it's not up here. It's somewhere down here. And it's kind of a scary feeling, isn't it? Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. it just shows us how, and I, I mean, you and I aren't alone in this. Like, I think this is just one of the, this is, I think, one of those perennial, it's, a, it's one of those perennial problems or dangers. I think it happens to most of us. But then there, there is a there is something idiosyncratic about the way that it happens too. Mm. I don't know if you find this in, when you when you encounter people, but I find that some people, just depending on their personality type and their profile, um, tend to be a little bit more susceptible to this maybe than others. Like I think some of us live a little bit more submerged in the imaginary than others and maybe i wonder how much sometimes i don't know if this is true but i wonder sometimes how much how much it depends on introversion or extroversion mm -hmm. as personality type like i wonder if introverts are a little bit more susceptible to this mm -hmm. than extroverts are i don't know I, i'm not sure it's just a it's just something i wonder about um but then waking up from that i think is a really it's a really really difficult thing but there's a lot of there's so much potential in waking up from it. Yeah. So many yeah. things become available. And I think one of the things that becomes available is, is the, is the possibility of decision mm -hmm. in the truest sense. Right. Cause I think I, I mean, I find that too, that, so many things, so many actions, when they're moved by that imaginary or the fantastical, the fantastical just immediately makes use of all of the implicit anxieties mm -hmm, mm -hmm. without reflecting on them. Yeah. And then when reflection is brought into the imaginary, I think that's when, I guess, you talked about John's use of imaginal. I think that's when it becomes more imaginal right when it mm. when the imaginary becomes then the contemplative device mm. that's when i think it becomes imaginal so I, it's like i don't think dispelling the imaginary is mm -hmm. possible mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but i think like implanting it with a conscious form and intent takes all of those nested anxieties and all of, all of the things that are implicitly and invisibly moving attention and suddenly characterizing them mm -hmm. right suddenly giving them like a, a giving them texture so that we can actually see what's going on right like i think a lot of these sort of imaginal practices like internal family systems practices or active imagination in the union sense like i think that's what a lot of these things are doing right mm. Something's moving me, right? Like the whole idea of complex is moving us and that complexes can be rendered as characters if we bring a kind of a conscious lantern down into the cellar of that and go, okay, what's actually going on here, right? Dreams, mm -hmm. like dream work. I think so much of dream work is about that too. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, yeah, maybe those are just some initial thoughts on it. I think it's a, it's a phenomenally fascinating problem. Yeah. And there can be a lot of joy in, I, I think it's a source of a lot of like a, a, a lot of, um, a lot of, a lot of fear and a lot of mm. shame and self-reproach when we catch ourselves in the, I find like when I catch myself in the act mm. of that, there's a lot of that. But then when it becomes a project in itself, it can actually be a whole lot of fun.
<laughs> I would like to I want to throw one comment and then I wanted to, I would love to hear more about what you mean by a lot of fun. The comment I would want to add is um one of the things that seems to be a theme in my journey trying to explore and, and bring more of my my own imaginal imagination imaginary processes into the light has been i guess you could say trauma processing i guess you could or you mm -hmm. could say therapy work that starting to understand more what what is i've been doing the um the focusing and and trying to get the felt sense of what's underneath this anxiety or that anxiety and start to fill them out and then like you said it becomes much more a conscious process where i can recognize when when this fantasy is playing that oh, it, oh it's this one again saying this thing what what happens to you when you catch yourself in it when you when you actually when you have eye when you when you get eyes on it what kind of feeling do you get it used to be a lot of guilt and shame like you said mm -hmm. um for a while like for 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 quite a while um but recently only very recently maybe 2 weeks or so i've, I've there's been less of that mm -hmm. i think something i'm not sure exactly what it was but cuz there's a bunch of things that have been moving around but something moved enough to kind of get a little bit more of a sense of acceptance of the process maybe yeah um and and i suppose maybe part of that was just a recognizing that whatever say the stencil lines are that are kind of drawing me forward um, they they've brought me to a life that's better than what i could have imagined even unconsciously so there's a sense of trust i have to have even in those that i see as uh, those that i see as having unhealthy strains in them oh that's interesting yeah and that's part of the thing that's weird with it it's like i don't it's not been wholly bad or anything right right, right. So that even so that the things so if I'm understanding what it means that the th the things that are unconsciously driving you, though they might reveal if on closer inspection, they might reveal sometimes that you know decisions aren't really decisions or that there's a certain amount of like being in the passenger seat of your own actions. If you're honest and well rounded about how you look at them when you see them, you have to admit that there's things about them that are adaptive and helpful and that they've born you not only to, you know, it's not like they've born you to a terrible life, <laughs> you know, that they've, that they've done you a certain amount of good. And that like the personality that you have that sort of driven you to the places that you've ended up, however foolish it might be in part, it's not wholly foolish. It's not, it's right. It's, it's it's not it's not an and it's not just an antagonist to you. Mm -hmm. It's purely wise, I think. That's mm -hmm. I think that's a really insightful thing to keep in mind. Because mm -hmm. I think it's a, it's really easy just to pathologize ourselves that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well there there was, you know, it's not something I hadn't heard before, but David Schindler said it to me when I was to something kind of like this when I was in the early stages of this I mentioned it to him and he said you know don't fight yourself because either way you, you whether you win or lose you lose mm -hmm. mm. and mm -hmm. at first I thought oh yeah you know and then like I've thought about it more and more and more as I'm going through this because it's like every time I turn around I can't tell whether it's me or not me and and so and John's I think it's episode 11 of After Socrates, where he talks about the dialogical self. Um, that's been super helpful 
in starting to it seems like it's grace you know mm. it's, it's 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 a it, it's a grace to uh, i i suppose give give license to voice for parts of myself that aren't critical necessarily yeah and that and that, that by giving them their due they reveal themselves too you know mm. like they come out in the open and it's like we can't always help who we are you know we can't always help i i mean in the i think in the in the fullness of time we try to you know, apply as much rigor to how we like. There's all there's obviously capacity for for change and for development, right? That's what all of this is just based on is that idea. Yeah. But <laughs> but I think that like we we do come we come with certain we come with certain things that are kind of etched in, mm -hmm. and um, wherever they come from, right? Whatever combination of you know whatever combination of of genes and conditioning and whatnot they kind of like where how you know where where they come where they hail from they're they're pretty they're pretty etched mm -hmm. and um and <clears throat> trying to cut something out or feeling like you need to cut something out i think we, I, we jump to that a lot you know mm -hmm. and i don't really think it works that way not exactly Right. You don't just cut something out like it's a, you know, like it's a, like it's a growth or, you know, um, it's like, you have to, it's like, we somehow have to work with what we have hmm. and, and find a way to make it work in such a way that it, that it, whatever its natural patterns or processes are that they can, there's a, there's a more conscious and more deliberate use for them that sort of serves the, the good of us but um but it, yeah i think that's a really good point ken that's like i think that's why christianity has become like i've i have a great deal of respect and admiration for christianity but it, i think that's why it's become so difficult for me to engage with is the the focus on the sin the focus on the sinfulness and the ridding of the self of sin. Like I get it. And I like, trust me, I get that. Right. Like, <laughs> I'm, I'm very into that, but <laughs> <laughs> like, I very much want to be rid of all my sin, <laughs> but it's like, um, there's, there's something about a primacy of focus um, that I think is what has I don't know, I've been trying for a long time to try to put my finger on what it was that hurt when I still go to churches. Yeah. Yeah. It's a tough one, eh? I, I mean, p p p <laughs> sin's a tough one. Who knew? Um, <laughs> but you know, one thing I find helpful, this has been really helpful to me periodically over the course of time especially when um wrestling with like an insecurity about you know myself or my personality especially when you see it and it sort of like comes out and you look at it and you're like oh i wasn't exactly in control of whatever happened there and you get very self-conscious <laughs> about it and you go oh no oh no am i that am i that <laughs> am i that right yeah and especially if it comes out you know in a, in a way that you weren't expecting you go oh shoot what is what is and but i think what helps with that is and what begins the possibility of an, like an interested dialogue mm -hmm. between the part of you that is the conscious tension and the feature or part of you that is the the discovery mm. right the novel thing that's chafing and that you need to get to know a little bit better, not to dispel it, but to get to know it so that it can become more consciously part of you, more mm -hmm. consciously integrated. 
is to have somebody, you know, and this is, I, I think you're you, you bringing sin into it is interesting because I think one of the things like the, I think the less, the less, hmm, the features of Christianity, I think that are more helpful for this is, is the idea of reconciliation, right? Like the idea of, of reconciling that that you're that you're loved i think it's a tricky idea but in some sense you're loved as much for the sin mm. as mm. In spite of it right and just think of like the people who love you and the people who love you and who adore you right whether they be family or friends or wh whomever chances are like the ones that really do right mm. They love you as much for mm. all of your tics as in spite of them, right? Mm. In fact, mm. probably more so. I think we actually, like, I think we actually love each other more for the things that make us um, quite fallible and neurotic mm. Mm. than for those things that make us impressive. Mm. right strangers might admire us for the things that make us impressive but i think intimates love us for the things that make us neurotic mm. and fallible and i think that that to me that's much like i understand because because it's the whole right it's the love toward the whole and the love toward the whole must include the brokenness, mm. right? Like we were talking a little bit about that when we were talking with um, the wonderful conversation you and I had with David Schindler yeah. a little yeah. bit, right? That somehow the brokenness has to become a feature of what makes us whole, what makes us ourselves. And that by it's by the grace of that brokenness especially when it's forgiven or when it seeks forgiveness and it seeks to belong to that whole and it becomes the way through to that whole mm. that whatever part of us is so is is inherently prone to erring and sinning right those parts that drift and lapse into the imaginary and are moved by the anxiety or moved by appetitive um, forces it's the grace given to those broken parts mm. that allows for the movement toward that wholeness and i yeah. i find it helpful especially when caught in a loop of self-flagellation over those parts yeah. to take the perspective of one who you know, to take the perspective of one of those people who isn't me, but who might look at that knowing me and find a way to love it. Mm. Not because they're trying, but be just because that's what they do. And, and I think that that's just sort of a, a symbolic proxy for this idea of being this idea of the, the love of the, the, when properly speaking, the love that we, you know, the agapic love that we talk about in Christianity that sees the brokenness and graces it with comprehension. Mm. And That's I think true. it's some almost as though we need that needs to be part because the whole like Socratic developmental project mm. of trying to become conscious of those things and rewire and unwind certain things like I think that's all good. But I think that in order for that, I, I mean, just increasingly starting to believe that in order for that to be possible, the grace given to those broken parts must be a feature of that process. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, what motivates, what motivates it, if not for that, right? What overcomes the shame and the guilt, mm. if not that grace, which allows for the room which allows for the peace to undertake that project, right? 
because yeah. it can be tough to undertake if you're just too busy stewing and you know yeah stewing in the broken yeah it's almost like if you're trying to if you're the fly trying to get out of the spider web and all you can push against is more of the spider web then yeah yeah satan beating his wings as it were yeah <laughs> keep, keep keep keeping himself in the frozen lake mm -hmm. that yeah. notion of I don't know. There's a different quality in the way you talked about the love for the brokenness than I think I've felt before. Because, I mean, I've I've thought some about agape, and it's very important to me. And I, I've thought about it in terms of the love for the brokenness that calls it into wholeness. But I don't think, I don't think I ever really thought of it in the way that. I just heard you say it, which is more of a, it's not loving it. It's not loving the brokenness as a means to an end of bringing the brokenness into wholeness. And that, that feels different to me, the, the loving the brokenness as an end. Mm -hmm. and, and am I hearing you correctly with that? Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of counterintuitive. Um, it doesn't make sense. Mm. But I think that's the point. Like, I think that's why. I think that's I think that's what's reasonable about it. You know, paradoxically enough, is that it it defies that it, it defies a certain kind of reason. Mm -hmm. And. And I don't. I don't know that I can. I, I. I. I don't know. I can argue for it. I don't know if I can justify it. I, but I just. I do. I just. Just feel it's true. Mm -hmm. Um. And when I think about the example of like really good relationships, that seems to me to be somehow like right at the foundation of it. Right. Is well, that kind of it seems like it almost has to be. Yeah. Because I guess it's funny how sometimes when you see something from a different angle, you're confused about how you saw it from the other one before. Because now that I'm seeing it this way, it's like doesn't that have to be the case? Because if if love is the the allowing for another person to be real that includes the brokenness and not as a means to an end oh that man wow that's that's really good okay i'm gonna have to <laughs> that's what i'm gonna let roll around for a while because i like that a lot So other oh, go ahead. No, no, please. I was gonna divert back to something before, but well, I, I guess the last thing I was just gonna say is that I think you, you were you were asking before, maybe this is where you were about to go. You were asking before how this process can be fun. Yeah. Or like, and I think that's how. Mm -hmm. Um I think that's how because <laughs> It's really hard to invest into the self inquiry hmm. if it's just a hotbed of like shame and guilt. You know, like otherwise, like I don't want to go there. <laughs> you know, yeah. yeah. I mean, it it can be that, but it can't be only that. It just that's just <laughs> like it can't. Yeah, it can't yeah. right. Yeah. So like your picnic picnic basket we're going to mordor oh yeah no kidding like exactly Oof. um no thanks i'll skip i'll skip that day <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> stay in the shire yeah stay in the shire 
it's I'll, I'll happily remain unconscious. Thanks very much. Like if, you know, the price of becoming conscious is to wait into Mordor. Of course, that's obviously part of the whole, that's part of the whole mythic structure. It's what makes it so hard. Um, but I think that that bringing that kind of grace allows, even if you have to import it, from someone else. And I think we do. I think that's the whole point of these relationships is to allow us to import it from somewhere. Um, I think allows for the possibility of looking more closely at these things and finding them interesting and not interesting in a dispassionate way. Right. But interesting, like f being able to love them mm. and um, being able to love the part. And um, and I think sometimes the ability to be able to love the part that is really out of sorts mm -hmm. is a borrowed is a borrowed grace. Mm -hmm. I think it's really a borrowed grace. Mm -hmm. I think we run into trouble a lot when we don't have anyone to borrow it from. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that is where I think a lot of people, a lot of us, run into real problems mm. um which is why the relationships i think are so key mm -hmm. right because i think they allow us to borrow the grace and hold it even if we have to and that and that's where the imagine you, you were talking before about imagining perspectives on you mm. in an egoic way mm -hmm. And I think that when we imagine, ah, it's tricky. Eh? It's like when we imagine others' perspectives on ourselves, mm -hmm. I think there's often an assumption we're making that the egoic model that we're projecting out as persona is what other people are taking into hand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they're not. That's the thing. They're not. And it's so hard to remember mm -hmm. that whatever model we have of self-presentation is not how we're taken. Mm -hmm. We don't know how we're taken. Mm -hmm. And the ignorance of that can be really scary, but it can also be a source of great um, interest and excitement. But a certain amount of egoic, like nattering, a certain amount of egoic fear has to be relinquished mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for that to become interesting. Because otherwise, we're just going to get worried about pre presentation and ju and just get so caught up with that mm -hmm. that the capacity to become interested as a project of novelty just will never occur. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and because... uh, hard. It's hard to give that up, though, right? It's hard to give that up. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, because that's, that's at least in my experience, that seems to be where most of it comes from, is the, it's the desire to hold a version of presentation or perception, right? It's like I want to, it's the desire to maintain some, or, or, it's the desire for someone to see you in a in a certain way, or even the desire to see yourself in a certain way. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'd like to pull a couple of things together here. One is we started with the question of something like how in what manner might you interact with your experiences of imagination such that they become better and more conscious and it seems like we arrived at something like we need to bring into consciousness and integrate the idiosyncratic parts of ourselves that have anxieties and different um, components that pull at us um, especially from an unconscious space mm -hmm. and that <clears throat> the way that happens is something like love agopic love for the brokenness in itself and so 
and that to some degree that is, becomes borrowed from other people. And so that strikes me as a decent proposal for what forgiveness is. And I guess forgiveness mm -hmm. is something I've looked at a couple of times, but maybe we could look at that a little bit if you're open to it. Yeah, sure. I think I think identifying it as that is I think is a good move. It's a good move. It's kind of the key to this whole thing. Right? I mean, if you're a Christian, it's definitely key to this whole thing. Um and it's a really mysterious thing. Um giving it and seeking it are both really mysterious things and i think of, and i think it's pretty clear that giving it and seeking it are are part of the same project right mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. it right? certainly seems to be the case in it throughout the teachings of christ it does it does and i and i think that there's a real there's a clear but i think that there's there's great like there's good reason in that mm. because like I don't think it's an arb like of course none no 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 it's arbitrary. Um <laughs> but the good reason in it seems to me is that the way that you set I I don't I don't know if this is true. I'll just sort of throw it out and maybe you could tell me what you think. But I think the 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 thing that sensitizes you to the possibility of being forgiven. Mm -hmm. is the experience of forgiving. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It shows you the possibility of it. And it also shows you It makes it makes it real as an act, right? To use your to use your phrase. It makes it real. And um and I think that's I think that has a lot to do with why that that it's so transitive, that it somehow it mediates, like it bind it binds everything together. Because if you've been able to forgive, if you found it possible to forgive, especially if especially if you went from being completely unable and finding it and found it hard to imagine such a thing. Because I think in some ways, like there are entire complexes that are based in the refusal to forgive, right? That are based in a kind of perennial anger or resentment resentment probably is the, the most operative one mm -hmm. and resentment in some ways i think is the persistent refusal to forgive mm -hmm. yeah, that seems right and i think so many so many of these ticks so many of these lapses of imagination are seated in resentful um streams resentful characters mm -hmm. whether it's resentful like reflexive resentment or resentment directed outward and they're often the same right they're often bound together right resentment towards someone or something is often just reflexive but but then forgiveness in some ways is the is the exhuming of that resentment and it and the dissipation into the open air of that resentment and i think then if you're able to let it, if you're able, if it's, you know, if you're able to relinquish it, then the reflexive part of it becomes a, actually a soluble thing. It becomes something you can, you know that there's actually a, the possibility of being real beyond it. Mm. You know that there's actually the possibility of being real. Or the the thing forgiven, do you mean? Yeah. Mm. 
Hmm. So oh, something man, that's, that's beautiful. The um the questions coming up for me is So often, it seems like, <clears throat> excuse me, resentments and even these parts of our imagination that we were talking about before are in this unconscious layer, at least partly. So does forgiveness have a sort of search function? Or is it a responsive? Is it responsive only? Or is there an activity to it? Mm. Can you say more? I think I know what you mean. But I'm not 100% sure. Do you mean the giving of it? Or the seeking of it? Hmm. I guess I'm thinking of it not so much as as the searching for it but as the act of forgiveness itself okay is it is i mean i'm thinking of it in terms of like a virtue being operative through me or something that <clears throat> i i i'm wondering if participating forgiveness is done as a response to a discovered state of brokenness? Mm -hmm. Or is there something in forgiveness that's actually a an active going forth to to seek and save the lost, as in, in, to use a Christian phrase? Mm -hmm. Or then am I blending forgiveness with love? Well, I think that's a fair blend. Like I wouldn't. <laughs> I, I think that's probably a. I think that's a correct blending. I, I wouldn't want to unblend that. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. So, you you don't get forgiveness without love, I suppose. They rest on each other. Yeah, I think it's very fair to say that forgiveness is love. Like I don't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't even try. To, I wouldn't. Even, I wouldn't even try to pull that those things apart. Mm -hmm. Um. It's a really good question, Ken, and it never even occurred to me that question. Um, hmm. Well, maybe it's I don't I don't I mean I don't know, um, but perhaps it's maybe the two the two directions of forgiveness are the two alternatives um i wonder if the the seeking seeking it for yourself is the is the more active is the more purposeful mm. and the giving it is the responsive and the mm -hmm. reactive and and maybe they're just two different they're two different movements, but I mean, the, it would almost make sense for there to be right. The bi-directional movement is kind of it comes up again and again as a as a motif, right? As a feature of faith. Yeah, and so I intuitively it would make sense to me that one is re reception and one is um. One is, a, one is a movement of return back and one is a movement forward or something like that. And I think that's why they happen. Like, I think that's why they happen simultaneously, right? Like when you, in the act of forgiving, I think something is, you find yourself forgiven. Mm. Like, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, it's so yeah. <sighs> It's so easy to lose this key existential reality that whatever we do is done to us simultaneously. 
right? Every action yeah. we take in every action we take in the world is reflexive. Every single one. Mm -hmm. There's nothing that we can do to someone else that is not simultaneously done to us, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I mean that's that's certainly a scriptural um, reminder, right? Mm -hmm. Again and again. And and that's why the way we treat each other is not a tr it's not it's not a trifle and and you know the do unto others is not a like as you know your neighbor as yourself business is not like it i think when you dig into that it's like something it's like a, it's like an ontological thing right it's not yeah, just it's, it's not it's, moralism it's, no it's not it's that's <laughs> it's exactly like that's beautifully put yeah it's not moralism it's not moralism yeah it's it's you know your brother is you like that's it's it's an identity relation. <laughs> yeah. It's a it's a direct identity relation. It's really hard to to think of it that way, but I think it's something like that, right? Mm -hmm. And so whatever you do happens to you. And that's why forgiving is so critical to being being forgiven. Um and that's why and that's why the stakes are always high even if we don't realize moment to moment that the stakes are high, which means that the precipitousness of, of like, or that, not that, sorry, that, well, I'm not sorry, I meant the, um, or the, or the precariousness, that's what I meant to say, mm -hmm. of, of every action. I think that's why the anxiety of acting in the world is so ratcheted up because I think we have some awareness, even if the awareness is buried and I think it's often just buried, mm. you know, um, but we have some dim awareness. Yeah. And that's the whole idea of like, you know, the, I think that's what, what brings sin back into it or something like that. Right. The idea of sinning in every the possibility of sinning in every moment is that at every given moment, we can forget that identity relation. Yeah. And we can act heedless of the fact that everything that we do, every action we take, every position we take relative to another is a position we're taking on our own selves and soul and whatnot. You know, something, yes, yes, yes. Like that is, I'm just, I like I'm seeing all the, all the places where especially Christianity was used as a um, or the church was used as a ground to commit evil and just noticing how profoundly that Christian principle was forgotten yeah. in such a way as to allow that evil to happen. <clears throat> um and i think even now you know i i have lots of conversations with people who um are christians and are very interested in um controlling what they see to be evil in the world um in specific ways that i i think it would be hard to reconcile with this kind of perspective of you know that that what you do to others you do to yourself um and i'm just noticing the you know that the tension that lies around the question of i guess you know what 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 they say back to me when i when i think about that is something like well you know doesn't evil have to be fought? And that's such an that's such a strange question to me. I don't know what to make of that question. Sorry, I just that that's a real doesn't, that's a real curveball from left field. But doesn't evil have to be right? Right. And we so don't is have to there, tackle that? But. So is there? <laughs> <laughs> you, don't have to, you don't have to tackle evil. Thank goodness. <laughs> It's too early in the morning to tackle yeah, evil. <laughs> Got to wait until at least like 1 p.m. for tackling. Just stick with forgiveness. Let's just leave evil out. 
<laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I, I mean, my, my instinct of like the reaction I feel inside when you say like, don't we have to fight evil? It's like, yes, of course we do. But what, but yeah. then what, what the, what's the, then I think the question is what's, what's the tension? What's the tension between that? Cause I think you're, maybe you're saying that there's perhaps or perceived to be a tension um, between the, the necessity of fighting evil in a Christian sense and the, and the idea of that reflexive like existential action. Is there, I'm like, what, what, where do you think the tension is? Where do you see it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I can try because I've been living it a lot. I, like I grew yeah, up in a, in a setting of where non-resistance was, you know, kind of a, an Anabaptist non-resistance mentality and so it's always kind of been conscious for me and and you know the notion of the stories of the martyrs um the even even the example of christ of and you know christ is doing a particular thing but yeah that doesn't mean that it's we're not necessarily called to do the same thing i think but this this turn the other cheek and if you know a roman soldier tells you to carry his pack a mile carry it two mm. um that kind of posture towards evil is one that feels very uncomfortable and I get pretty negative or not negative necessarily, but pretty react reaction reactionary feedback from most people. If, if I try to actually like represent the, or like really bring up the question of, you know, what, what about repay evil with good, you know, and, and what about Jesus is, you know, resist not evil. Mm. Um, <clears throat> and so I guess I haven't explicitly tied in the you know reflexive nature of action here but that seems to me to play in mm. Um, mm. but I don't know how to balance that with justice um, okay yeah, I, I think that's That's a good problem. What what sort of comes up for me as you you say that, I, mean, I don't know, it's just a way of finding a way in to the problem, is that's a way in which I'm reminded a lot of the 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 turn the other cheek. Um that whole that whole that whole posture that's where christ reminds me a lot of socrates mm. and especially when it concerns justice mm. these the, to me that starts to become a really interesting axis mm. because because i think i mean i i'm not saying i understand that passage but my reaction to the passage or like my, my, what I read into it is there's, there's, there's so much, but one of the things I read into it is that is I read into it platonically, which is to say that, you know, turning the other cheek, it's like, there's a, there's a marshalling together of oneself in decision mm. in response to being tormented or antagonized it's the difference between a reflexive reaction or an automatic, instinctive, unreflective reaction. Mm. Something that's not mediated by purpose and deliberation. Mm. When you're at quits with yourself, right? When you're when you're at variance, right? When you're when you're not together, 
you react impulsively to being antagonized. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be physical. It could be just the ridicule of a crowd or whatever. But you react impulsively to it because there's a part of you that reacts impulsively to it because you're not brought together justly in terms of the different parts of the psyche, right? Mm -hmm. And what I've always imagined about that passage or that particular stance of Christ in those moments is that is that the, the, the resistance of evil is the resistance of evil within the self. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, it's, res it's the resistance of the evil that erupts and is elicited by the torment, by the abuse. Mm. I, I don't I, I find it difficult to literally take those things to, or may, maybe we should. I don't know. Like, I don't know. Right. Maybe that's part of the question, right? <laughs> maybe that may, like, may, is the thing to strive for in the most literal terms, turning the other cheek. Maybe, maybe. I don't know. Mm. I don't know. Um, I don't know. Are any of us or are the vast majority of us capable of that? I don't know. <laughs> but, um, but the I, the way I, I, to even begin thinking about it for me is 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 to have the unreflective reaction to torment and to evil be evil itself, and that by accepting the punishment but reframing its meaning and its existential import and its capacity to determine my agency mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i have mm -hmm. overcome i have overcome it that's a very kind of stoic move i suppose so yeah, yeah. i guess that's where the the socratic drifts into the christian is right probably yeah. there's, some, there's some there's some there's some stoic mediation there going on um it's the so I think yeah that's the way I, I'm tempted to think about it is that the prevailing over evil, the prevailing over evil persists, but it persists as a as a as an inward movement, and um, what that means for the outward movement, like whether that forecloses active you know resistance, I don't know. I I can't quite believe that it forecloses. I find it difficult thinking of it in those literal terms. But that just might be my failure of imagination. I don't know. Well, one of the things that I often, I think that's a that's a really good start at it, of noticing that how much, because the internal has to happen first, right? That internal justice. That was what I was hearing you say. It's like, you know, the justice, the justice has to happen internally. But one of the things I find once I get to this kind of point with this question is that I often don't have, like, there's something I don't have in order to like truly consider what the perspective would be like. Not, not, not to necessarily believe it or anything, but to actually like inhabit the perspective of of it taken as literally i don't know if i don't have the courage to do it it almost feels like a lack of courage in me it's like i can't like there's something about this this you know it's, it's like <laughs> it's like all the all the all my ancestral lineage rebels against the possibility of considering that a truly like non-resistant stance towards <laughs> evil. But I don't know because here's here's the argument. Here here's one of the things that causes me trouble here though is if we put kind of a karmic lens on the web of reality and the <laughs> the way in, in which I I always feel as if I'm you know caught up in a in a 
web that stretches infinitely. And <clears throat> as such, it's quite uh, it's quite a mistake to make the determination of any particular thing as good or evil, right? Because it's I, I, where am I going to measure? Where am I going to measure? Where am I going to stop? Where am I going to start? And that seems to me to give some credence to the possibility that maybe Jesus actually means it. That from the level, and and there's something about the we we struggle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers kind of thing. It's like maybe there's maybe it's a problem of level of engagement. Mm -hmm. Um, that seems to be maybe a way out. But to finish the first part, there's this sense in which my resistance to a pattern of action that I can that can quite obviously be labeled as something evil. I don't know if I can, I don't know if I have the requisite wisdom to engage with it in such a way that I know I'm not perpetuating evil in some way. Mm. Mm -hmm. right. So maybe the way out is a, uh, is a, a way of acknowledging something like that, the individuals playing out the patterns that the struggle is against the pattern right <clears throat> and that the way to struggle against it is to call to the person who's manifesting the pattern and maybe this is forgiveness that can drop out i i i imagine it almost as a like it's a call to consciousness of the agent who is expressing a pattern of behavior that's not native to them. You mean the that the turning the other cheek is the call to consciousness, right? Call to consciousness. Yeah, yeah. So I think yeah. that's. I think that's a profound idea. I think that's a profound idea. That what you do, it's like you're trying to. That the only way to prevail in the game is to is to up is to refuse to play is to play a different one mm. um is to change what the game is to change what the pattern to reintroduce a pattern that breaks the previous one and and that in and i i think that that would map onto the idea that there's inherent self-sacrifice in that mm. right because what you're doing is if you're turning the other cheek is a self-sacrificial move and the self-sacrificial move is necessary in order to call forth consciousness. Mm. And we certainly see that pattern both with Socrates and with Christ. And yeah, I mean, there's a certain elegance to that. There's a symbolic elegance to that. Mm. What do we do with that in the flesh of the day? Like that's, I hear that, I hear that from you. I hear that, like that, that stress and struggle. And it's a good question. I wonder how much it has to, so in both of the, so in these examples, the ones that you're giving, there, the context is specific. The context is it, injustice being done to you. I wonder if it changes the way we think about it a little bit, if we change the example and we think about it as what you do for another, right? Um there's this, uh, I was ta I was talking with a friend the other day and he was telling me about this thing that happened in, uh, I think it was in Vancouver, I can't remember, where um, there was this, I think it was like in a restaurant or something. 
and um, or a coffee shop or something like that. And there was this sudden like outbreak of violence, like someone someone was sitting next to someone else and just brandished a knife and just attacked the person. Mm. And it had this sort of like randomness and chaos of just this sort of, you know, the, 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 it it was, it was a, it was a very sort of unprovoked thing. And so because of that was quite terrifying to people, it was a sudden thing of terror. And instead of, and I, this, this story is now like secondhand. So I have no idea of like, or third hand. So I don't know how accurate this is, but it does an example. Like you can think of it as a thought experiment, mm-hmm. but so the person brandishes a knife and attacks the other person and stabs him. And the people around do not intervene to assist the person like no one comes to help instead what everyone does is they take out their phones and they start filming it and you know person nearby closest to it just sort of keeps drinking their coffee as though you know as though nothing is happening as though nothing is going on and just sort of minds their business right Mm. the sort of urban apathy kind of situation where to sort of self-preserve everyone just sort of stays in there stays at a remove stays uninvolved takes a record of things but takes no direct action now you know i hear a story like that and it's it's quite sickening and i think the right response to a story like that to me is to like reflect on yourself and to wonder to like place yourself into a situation like that and imagine imagine who you would be imagine what would occur to you in a situation like that and to really put yourself through the like put yourself through the trial of imagining that you might not be as courageous as you would hope that you would be in a situation like that but to do it in an aspirational way right to try and really really contemplate it and to try and make it as real in the to make it imaginal to make it as real in the imagination as possible to confront the possibility and use it as a way of measuring your own courage in a kind of inward dialogue now i think of a situation like that and i think the 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 turning the other cheek seems not to fit in that situation right the correct like in some sense there's something quite courageous about turning the other cheek because it's a deliberate act Mm -hmm. it is a decision to turn the other cheek it's not to be confused right like we have to measure it by its internal geometry Mm -hmm. not by its outward appearance which to me is like really important when talking about these things Mm -hmm. Because you could say of the person who doesn't fight back, well, maybe they're just like, maybe they're just, they don't have the courage to fight back. And I don't think that's the point, right? Right, right. right. Yeah. The point is that the courage that they're bringing to bear is a, de- is a decision mm-hmm. not to fight back, which means the, there, is a, there is a real possibility of fighting back. Mm-hmm. And the mm-hmm. courage in not fighting back requires there to have been a real possibility of doing so which is not true if the person is just instinctively fleeing or going into like if a, if a person is just lapsing into an instinctive flight response and staying uninvolved or staying passive because they cannot bring themselves to do anything more active i think that failure of courage is a is a is a failure of whatever virtue also is being invoked by turning the other cheek what am I saying by all that? I think, so I think it has, however we measure out the virtue that is being demonstrated by that position, I think it has something to do with be ha- taking a decisive position toward evil mm-hmm. and being properly marshaled in relation to it 
And I can't imagine that turning the other cheek would fit in the literal action and in, in the literal action of it would fit a situation in which somebody nearby was being, you know, brutalized mm -hmm. and to simply allow it to happen like that to me, just it does something about that just doesn't, it doesn't land coherently. Right. It doesn't land as a coherent stance. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine that that's what it means. Because I think we look at a, a situation like that, and I think it's right to be sickened mm -hmm. by the failure of anyone to act or assist or intervene, right? Mm -hmm. But what the, I mean, no one was demonstrating turn the other cheek because that would have required a fortitude to make such a thing possible. Mm -hmm. And the opposite would have to be possible at the same time, right? Mm -hmm. um, anyway, I that that was a very kind of... I wanted to bring that in just as a way of, of just challenging the frame and mm -hmm. and uh, to to ask the question like what are we really talking about when we talk about this virtue mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um and I don't know if that fits together exactly but you tell me what you think how does that land on you I think that lands very well because I think that's it gets at the kind of tension that maybe it's a tonos, right? Maybe that's the point. Um, is to maintain that kind of tonos is what's my what capacity do I have to comport myself to a situation in which there is let's say violence being done whether to me to me or to someone else there's a there's a different question there um and it has i mean it, it seems there's something to do with uh responsibility that i hold for myself is different than the responsibility that i hold for others you know there's mm -hmm. There's there's something about my responsibility for my own actions such that I can it, it seems to be just for me to allow myself to say turn the other cheek and in some sense absorb an injustice in a way. Mm -hmm. There's something that doesn't doesn't seem to violate justice if that is done in a deliberate way based off of a courageous understanding that that's what I am in fact attempting to do mm -hmm. and maybe actually in trying to engage forgiveness. <clears throat> but I don't think that's a, a responsibility to and pull those words apart, a response that is available to me ah, right. in relation to another person. Right. Very because good. Because then suddenly I'm a party to the violence. In some way, it seems like. Right. Like for me, for me to, to, take it upon myself to. To almost you know force someone else to absorb violence, when I maybe could have done something about it. Right. <clears throat> is in itself some kind of. Like that strikes me as uh, as deeply unjust. Yeah, unjust. Yeah, I like that. I think you've I think you've clarified what I was trying to grasp at. Is yes, it's sort of the same. It's the same kind of failure. It looks. It appears different, but it's the same failure, right? Let's say that the 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 lapsing into passivity or the lapsing into indecision or the failure to bring oneself together around an action, whether it is failing to come to somebody's aid or failing to have the resolve to turn the other cheek, or actually they might have different consequences in the world, but they're actually of a kind 
in terms of their failure. Something like that I'm hearing from you. Mm -hmm. And, and that actually makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense because in both cases, I mean, that's what makes it hard, right? In both cases, accepting torment without impulsive retaliation or intervening to potentially save somebody's life, the situation requires it, are both self-sacrificial, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? They're both, they're both, they're both the giving up of oneself. Yeah, yeah, that's a nice through line. To serve something good, right? Mm -hmm. To serve the good in some sense, right? And uh, and that's why they're both they're both manifestations of courage. And they're both ontocentric in a way. And they're both ontocentric and not egocentric. That's exactly right. Mm. I think that's exactly right. So the orientation is what actually is what connects them. Not the action, but the orientation. From where does the action come and to what is the action directed? That's what that's what that's how they're refined together. Mm. Oh, that's very nice. That feels very nice. Yeah, I just like felt that tension. It was like Doosh. It's a really good question. And I like that. I like how concrete it is too, you know, because it's one thing to talk about these things up here, but it's, a, it's another thing to just imagine them in, in more concrete terms and, and have to walk the, the gauntlet of imagining them. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's one of the reasons why it's like where the, the uh you know holy week for easter has just begun right as of yesterday and uh and uh that's why one of the sort of prescribed the prescribed meditations or the prescribed activities in preparation for the week that i often hear heard it again actually just yesterday is to undertake a kind of imaginal act an imaginal activity about the passion mm. and i think that's what that's trying to do right it's trying to in part in part right it's trying to develop an inward dialogue with the kind of virtue the kind of inward coherence that would be required to undertake such an unimaginable thing mm. and what does it put you through even as an imaginal activity right i mean that's the that's the saint ignatius of loyola that's like the whole i think that's part of the point of those those um practices right is to sensitize to the possibility of having that required of you right not identically to the story of the passion mm -hmm. but in some manner, right? Yeah. And to tie it back to our original starting point, this, it strikes me that these In, in some way, what we're talking about is justice and the courage to engage with situations or relations such that they become more just or the justice is served, maybe. <laughs> and when it comes to the orientation of imagination, and these, say, internal parts of ourselves. It it seems to me that there's there's an interesting way in which both sides of of the turning of the other cheek and the say protecting of the weak 
have an operation to play in that like integration yeah. of the various parts of ourselves it's like <clears throat> there's a way in which i have to turn the other cheek to myself right but also a way in which i have to actively care for myself when um when another critical version of me is beating up on me oh that's good that's beautiful ken yeah and that right that and that that's that goes back perfectly to this sort of reflexivity this existential reflexivity that what you do is done to you right this idea that that the uh yeah yeah that you well you said it you said it perfectly i don't need to say it again that was that's really that's a good move that's a really good move that you made and then again it shows what like it it, it brings the interior and the exterior. it brings everything together right it bind it it's a, what a great way of binding us it's like we're always looking for ways of binding ourselves consequentially to the world <laughs> That's a pretty good way, <laughs> right? Yeah. That's a pretty good way. If there's a, if there's an, if if there's an, a direct identity mm. between the way that we treat ourselves and the way that we, try, I mean, it sounds like it sounds so trite when you just sort of say it plainly. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, most things of import really do when you just sort of. <laughs> when you take them out of the rigorous context and you just sort of splay them out, it's like, well, yeah, everybody knows that. Well, but, but do we, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> do we really, <laughs> you know, I don't yes. think we do. Um, but yeah, it makes, again, it makes the stakes clear and it makes the imperative clear and it makes it that much harder mm -hmm. to do. Mm -hmm. right like this is this is one thing talking about all of this it's a, but it's another thing actually it's another thing actually doing it right um you know if you're sitting if you're sitting next to somebody like on public transit and they're you know and 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 they're you know they're a little aggressive and they're and 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 they're they're you know <laughs> they're showing signs of being unpredictable and there's something quite chaotic about them. And they're, they've got like a, 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 you know, a Mickey of vodka in their hand. And it's like, you're very leery, right? It's like, you know, you're not, you're not, you're not your first instinct. None of our first instincts is to be, is to look directly at that person and mm. consider that person. And and understand them toward the whole, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, but I think to your point earlier, it's like, well, you know, maybe if we take the most robust version of this and we imagine it being real, it requires things of us that most of us are just not ready or willing to do. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. most of us are going to stay away from that person. Yeah, we're not even going to look at them, much less get into a conversation, much less go any further than that. And and does it mean literally that that's what we would need to do? I don't know. Like I don't know, but it, it it's tough to know what is what is right to do, what is helpful to do in any given situation, because you could just as easily make something worse as better. <laughs> But at but at, but at the same time, but again, it's not we're not really talking about acting with an eye, a clear eye to consequence. We're talking about act, like acting from orientation, right? Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we can anticipate consequence, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but we can understand orientation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those are hard things to bring together. I don't know how exactly how to do that, but I I I think that is 
like a really good place to start to bring it together, right? Because there's something in that of of the desire for the good. That you know, I I had this I had this moment last night. I was I was what was I cooking? Oh, I was cooking hamburgers, and I was out. I went outside to the grill, and I was just standing looking at the sunset, and I've been. I just finished the book, The Sovereignty of the Good, a little while ago, and I've been thinking mm. about the good a lot. And I had this moment where I was just like, man, all I really want is just, just good. I just, I just, I don't know what it is. I just want my life to be good. I want my actions to be good. And there was this incredible, like, feeling that kind of washed over me of just kind of the simplicity of the freedom of that. Mm. Because... <laughs> And that seems in some way to fly in the face of consequentialism. That it's just, what do you want? Well, I, don't, I don't really know. I just, I want good. And there, there's, there's a surrender in that, of that kind of like, how do I, how do I help this person? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe if I'm just here, what seems good to me might actually be good. Mm -hmm. if that's what if that's what you love let you know mm -hmm. if that's what you if that's what you're loving then yeah then maybe i know tough questions yeah well thank you chris we should probably draw it to a close here right. but um you've you, this has been incredibly helpful you've given me a lot to um you've been very gracious with helping me kind of move through some kind of chaotic things here but this has been super super helpful oh it's my pleasure this was good for me too i really yeah i always enjoy talking to you ken you're tremendously thoughtful and i love the and you're very you're good at you're good at like formulating like interesting problems because these are really hard hard problems and i like that i yeah i i, I like the way that you pose them and uh, and it's fun. It's fun just wading through them. Talk about it being fun. See this. This is fun. This version yeah. of it. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Chris. Until next time. Until next time, Ken.